Welcome to the lecture on bituminous materials. This is lecture 17 of the course on modern construction materials. Today we are going to talk about uh, bitumen and asphalt which are mainly used in pavements and also in other applications in uh, building construction. On the leader slide here uh, I have a picture of the Kardung Pass in Ladakh which at a height of about uh, 5400 meters is one of the highest motorable roads and it is quite a challenge here to have the asphalt in proper conditions so that it is motorable and if this road is cut off due to landslides or snow then uh, a huge area of Ladakh is cut off from the rest of the world. So, these are some of the challenges that are faced when roads have to be built under difficult conditions and asphalt comes in handy because it can be used in uh, a wide range of temperatures and environmental conditions. Bituminous materials are uh, let me start again bitumen and tar are hydrocarbons these are called uh, these bitumen and tar are hydrocarbons these are some of the bituminous materials that we use in civil engineering applications bitumen oh this uh, there is a mistake the bitumen is a bitumen based product petroleum based product no, we will continue we will continue it is ok. Now, let us see what are the different bituminous materials that are used. Bitumen and tar are hydrocarbons. Bitumen is a petroleum based product, it comes from the petroleum industry. Tar is obtained from distillation of organic substances like wood, coal, and bituminous shales. Tar, uh, in some cases, can be found um, in a natural state also. As I mentioned before, uh, bitumen and similar materials are used widely in road construction. Uh, 80 to 90 percent of road toppings are made out of bituminous materials. We also use bitumen in other applications related to building construction, say in waterproofing and damp proofing, to cut off uh, water going through either the roof material or the floor to access the interior of a building. In some cases bitumen or bituminous materials have been used for flooring and in uh, basements as water barriers again for damp proofing and for water proofing. As we said before bitumen is obtained from uh, petroleum, it is obtained from the fractional, fractional distillation it is obtained from the fractional distillation of crude petroleum and it is one of the end products. A major advantage or an important property of bitumen is that it becomes soft when heated. So, this makes it possible for pavements and uh, any other applications to heat the bitumen, apply it and let it reach the ambient temperature and become harder in that process. So, this is the reason why bitumen is used in many applications other than the other properties that it has. Blown bitumen is obtained by heating the bitumen until it becomes a liquid and passing air under pressure through it and the resultant blown bitumen is, has a higher softening point that is it does not uh, become soft at lower temperatures. Modified bitumen is becoming more and more common. It is a bitumen combined with polymers and sometimes with crumb rubber. Crumb rubber is uh, basically obtained from chopping up uh, tires of cars and mixed into the bitumen along with some polymers that is called modified bitumen. This modified bitumen has better flexibility that is it can deform 
without cracking. It has better resistance to weathering due to the effect of the environment and also it has better tolerance for ultraviolet rays. Remember when we talked about polymers we said ultraviolet light can cause the degradation of polymers and that could also happen in the case of bitumen. Due to these properties modified bitumen is used in waterproofing as bituminous felts. In a bituminous felt you have a mat made out of some fibrous material and the matrix and the adhesive material is bit modified bitumen. In pavements modified bitumen is becoming more and more common because it has higher resistance to plastic deformation that is it does not rot easily, it does not uh, deform due to higher temperatures that easily and it also has a higher resistance to fatigue that is it does not crack, it does not degrade under cyclic repetitive loading. Asphalt is generally what we call a mixture of bitumen with some mineral matter. This could occur naturally in some cases, but most commonly we use the artificial mixture of bitumen with aggregates that is pieces of stone. In some cases, in some areas, some regions of the world, asphalt also simply denotes bitumen. It is not necessarily the mixture of bitumen with something, but even bitumen is called asphalt. So, when you read literature, you should be careful about understanding if asphalt denotes just the bitumen or the mixture of bitumen with aggregates making some sort of a concrete. Bitumens have a very complex and variable chemical composition that comes from where the crude oil came from that it has been derived from. Generally the formula for bitumen is given here C n H 2 n plus B X D. These are all high molecular weight hydrocarbons. Here C as we know is carbon, H is hydrogen and X represents elements such as sulfur, nitrogen, oxygen or trace metals. D is usually very small and B can be even negative. The main fractions or constituents of bitumen are generally called asphaltines, resins and oils. Asphaltines are polymers that have higher molecular weights and they are in color dark brown to black and they are generally brittle solid matter. Since bitumen consists of a large number of molecules with different chemical compositions and structures. A complete chemical analysis is not uh, possible and it is not even technically necessary, it does not really make sense to know the exact chemical composition of a bitumen that is being used. That is why we looked at a general formula in the previous slide. We can think of bitumen as a colloidal system. Some people consider this as an uh, antiquated way of looking at it, but to understand how bitumen functions, it is good to uh, look at it as a colloidal system. So, bitumen can be thought of as a colloidal system where the asphaltines are solid particles in the form of molecule clusters or micelles. Micelle is a name for a molecule cluster. And in the colloidal system model, we think of the asphaltines in clusters or missiles dispersed in the oils with the resins forming an interface between the 
asphaltene missiles and the oil. Bitumen as such acts as a continuum or the different phases of bitumen act as a continuum with no distinct boundaries between them. The asphaltene missiles surrounded by a layer of resin are randomly distributed through the oil phase that is why we consider it as a colloidal system. Now, on the basis of this model and the structure that follows, bitumens can be classified as sols or gels or combinations of this or what we call sol gels. Sol as you know is a colloidal solution where you have solids dispersed in a liquid phase, a gel is where you have liquid dispersed in the solid and sol gel is where you have a mix of these two. So, in the case of a bitumen that is closer to a sol what we have is the asphaltene missiles separated and widely dispersed. Consequently, the bitumen is essentially viscous that is liquid like close to Newtonian with little or no elasticity. If you remember from the previous lectures. Newtonian is where you have a perfect behave uh, perf perfectly rein linear. If you remember from the previous lectures, a viscous material or a Newtonian material is where you have a linear relation between the shear stress and the shear strain rate, and an elastic material is that which, when deformed and the load is released the material recovers the deformation completely and comes back to its original state. So, in the case of a bitumen that is close to a sol, the bitumen is essentially like a liquid, it is viscous Newtonian with little or no elasticity. In the case of a bitumen that is closer to a gel, the missiles are discrete that is they are having finite shapes, but are bound in a complex three dimensional network that is they have formed a three dimensional network through molecular attraction. And consequently we can have elastic, inelastic and permanent deformational behavior in the material. In the case of sol gels you have intermediate behavior between the sol and the gel type behavior where initially the sol gel is more elastic followed by viscous behavior and therefore, finally, the material is considered viscoelastic that it has properties of both elastic materials and viscous behavior. So, here we can see in uh, sketches taken from Young et al the difference between the microstructures in the case of a bitumen that is close to a sol and another bitumen that is close to a gel. Above we have uh, the key to the different to the different uh, parts of this diagram. These are the asphaltenes, and then you have around the asphaltenes aromatic hydrocarbons, and then you have the naphthenic aliphatic hydrocarbons, saturated hydrocarbons around forming the forming the liquid phase in the case of a sol and here again the liquid phase in the case of a gel. So, in a sol we have the asphaltene missiles here surrounded by these aromatic hydrocarbons floating around dispersed in this phase which consists of all these th three types of hydrocarbons. In the case of a gel we have the missiles in a network. So, they form a certain structure and then you have the liquid dispersed within this network formed by the asphaltene missiles. Another aspect that is important to know 
when we discuss bitumen is that the structure and properties of bitumen change as a function of the temperature as well as the chemical nature. So, the structure and properties of bitumen are influenced not only by the chemical nature and how much of each constituent is present in the bitumen, but also the temperature or the ambient temperature that the bitumen is put in. As the temperature increases, the asphaltines flow more freely and the material becomes more closer to Newtonian that is it becomes less viscous that it, it flows more easily. Viscous here means that the viscosity is less viscous here means that the viscosity is lower. So, as the temperature increases the asphaltines flow more easily and the material has consequently a lower coefficient of viscosity. As the temperature decreases did I say increase or decrease before I make I mixed it up. So, as the temperature increases the asphaltines flow more freely and the material becomes less viscous. When we say less viscous here that means that the coefficient of viscosity decreases. So, as the temperature increases the asphaltines flow more easily and the material and the coefficient of viscosity of the material decreases. On the other hand when temperature decreases the asphaltines become less soluble that is they are more bound in an ordered structure and the material becomes more viscous or the coefficient of viscosity increases that it does not flow that easily as the temperature decreases. When with the temperature decreases even further eventually what happens is the temperature goes below the glass transition temperature and there the structure is frozen and the material does not flow that easily it behaves more like a rigid brittle solid. This is what we saw in the case of polymers happening where the ma material changes from a liquid like behavior to a solid behavior without much change in the microstructure that is what happened in a polymer when we go below the glass transition temperature similar behavior we have in bitumen also. Now, this is a graph taken from Young et al showing how viscosity decreases as the temperature increases. This has been obtained from tests using different types of rheometers and viscometers because of the appropriateness as a function of the viscosity. On the y axis we have viscosity in poises of a bitumen and on the x axis we have temperature. We find that the rheological behavior represented by the coefficient of viscosity is highly temperature dependent. We have viscosity significantly decreasing as the temperature increases especially when we uh, go above 0 degrees and there is a significant change in the values of viscosity. So, how should we specify bitumen? How should we say what bitumen or what type or what grade of bitumen should be used in practice? Normally, bitumen should be specified in terms of the apparent viscosity at a certain temperature say 60 degrees Celsius. Now, if you remember from the lecture on rheology, we defined an apparent viscosity for a material that is shear thinning or shear thickening. Only for a Newtonian material we can have a constant viscosity. In the other cases when we take a certain shear stress and a consequent shear strain in the shear stress versus shear strain diagram and join it to the origin we get an apparent viscosity. It is not the true viscosity, but an apparent viscosity. Also we saw that viscosity changes with temperature. So, when we make a specification we should say what would be the range of viscosity that is acceptable for that application and at what temperature we are measuring and a normal reference temperature is 60 degrees Celsius. This apparent viscosity specification reflects the resistance required against 
plastic deformation of the pavement that is how the deformation uh, can occur over time in a pavement is represented by this viscosity. As the apparent viscosity rises there is higher resistance against plastic deformation in the pavement. So, if you have higher temperatures occurring in an application we would go for a bitumen which has a higher apparent viscosity. Previously bitumen was specified in terms of a penetration grade. Nowadays penetration grade may also be given or a minimum penetration value may also be given in addition to the required viscosity. The penetration value is a measure of the hardness of the bituminous material. Higher the penetration means that the hardness is less very low penetration means the material is very hard and it is more difficult to penetrate the material and this gives us an idea of the potential for resisting cracks at low temperatures that is when the hardness is less there is a better potential for resisting cracks when the temperature drops. This is because that at low temperatures the material becomes more brittle and they can be cracking and when the material is very hard at room temperature it has a higher possibility of cracking when the temperature drops. So, higher penetration means you have a better potential for resisting cracks at low temperatures. This is how the penetration test is done. We have a recipient with the bitumen maintained at 25 degrees Celsius and we have a needle of a certain weight and this is allowed to penetrate during 5 seconds into the bitumen surface and the penetration is registered in 1 tenth of a millimeter. So, if you have a penetration grade of 80 100 that means the penetration in this test should be between 8 and 10 millimeters. Okay. So, if you have a penetration grade if you have if you have a bitumen with a penetration grade 80 by 100 that means that in this test the penetration observed should be between 8 and 10 millimeters. So, as an illustration let us see how a specification could be made for a certain application. Suppose we have to specify the bitumen grade for an application where the air temperature the ambient temperature is normally between 30 and 38 degrees Celsius. <coughs> we could say that the apparent viscosity should be between 1600 to 2400 poises and the penetration value should be more than 60. So, what we have here is an application which is not very very high temperatures we are saying that we need an apparent viscosity in this uh, range and a penetration value reasonably high because when the temperature drops to the lower end of this range or slightly lower we do not want to have cracking. So, we want a slightly lower hardness indicated by a penetration value of 60 as well as having a reasonably high viscosity value. So, that there is no deformation plastic deformation occurring at these temperatures. Suppose we have to specify a bitumen grade for an application where temperature is even higher say more than 45 degrees. So, there there is a higher possibility of plastic deformation at these temperatures. So, we want the bitumen to have a better viscosity grade or a higher apparent viscosity in the range of 3200 to 4800 almost double the viscosity as what we saw in the previous case where the temperatures was 30 to 38 degrees here when the temperature is more than 45 degrees we want almost double the viscosity we want a higher coefficient of viscosity so that the material does not flow that easily and you have less plastic deformation. Since the temperature is going to be very high we do not worry too much at what about we do not worry too much about what happens at very low temperatures. So, even a smaller 
penetration value is sufficient. So, the minimum penetration value here we say can be 35. Okay. So, this could be the way how we can specify bitumen grades based on the temperature that the bitumen will have to endure during its life. In terms of how the loading is handled, we can look at the concept of stiffness. So, again uh, this concept is being used less and less, but it is easy to understand uh, how bitumen should behave in a pavement when we look at the concept of stiffness. We know that the stiffness of bitumen varies as a function of temperature and also due to the loading. Temperature because the material becomes softer, more flexible as the temperature increases and we also know that bitumen is a material that has creep deformation as time increases due to um, the constant load or fatigue type loading we can have the stiffness decreasing. So, the stiffness given as S sub b bitumen uh, stiffness is a function of the stress strain behavior as a function of time and temperature. This is a diagram given by Young et al where uh, they look at how this stiffness changes with respect to time and temperature. So, say you have uh, you we look at this curve first at very short loading we have an elastic behavior where the stiffness can be represented by the elastic modulus or the Young's modulus of elasticity. As we keep the material under load or we have fatigue loading we find that as time increases time here is on the x scale we have the stiffness decreasing that is the material could be creeping or adjusting to the applied load to give more deformation. When the temperature increases the initial value drops we have a slightly lower stiffness as we increase temperature. The final slope is the same the final slope is given by this value 3 times the coefficient of viscosity divided by time this is the final slope. So, as temperature increases we find that the stiffness is lower at any particular time. So, for any particular time we have a lower stiffness at a higher temperature. If you go to a much lower temperature say minus 10 degrees you have an initial value that is higher that is the initial stiffness is higher and again the final slope is the same. So, here we see how the stiffness value changes with temperature as well as time both of these have influence of the stiffness of the bitumen. Another property that is important for bitumen is the tensile strength. This again decreases with an increase in temperature and time under load both higher temperatures and more time under load decrease the tensile strength of bitumen. We also find that there is an influence of the thickness of the film on the strength of the bitumen on the tensile strength of the bitumen. This has been attributed due to three aspects one is the decrease in the ability to flow that is as this thickness of the film say the film covering the aggregates in an asphalt concrete is lower then the tensile strength of the bitumen seems to be higher for a lower film thickness we have a higher tensile strength of the bitumen and this is because the bitumen does not flow that easily it is bound in a certain place and therefore, you have a higher tensile strength. Another aspect is that the probability of large flaws is 
less. Remember when we talked about probabilistic fracture mechanics and we looked at the uh, weakest, weakest link theory, we said that a higher volume of the material will have a higher probability of large flaws. So, similarly here because we have a thin film of bitumen, the effective strength of the bitumen is higher due to this thin film. Another aspect which seems to also give rise to this higher strength is the increase in the orientation of the molecules at the surface of the material. When the film is very thin, the molecules orient along the surface of the material and this apparently gives rise to higher tensile strength. Now, we have been talking about bitumen, but in the applications say in uh, pavements, we have to mix the bitumen with aggregates. So, for that we have to look at the concept of gradation of the aggregates and this curve, um, this plot gives you different types of gradation and we look at what would be a good type of gradation that should be used for asphalt concrete. The dark line in the middle is theoretically what we will have for maximum density of the aggregates considering a maximum aggregate size of about 20 millimeters or 19 millimeters. Okay. This is a curve showing you on the x axis the percentage passing and this is a, a plot showing percentage passing on the y axis and sieve size on the x axis. So, this is a typical curve that is used for sieve analysis uh, representation of aggregates, soil and different granular materials. So, what we have is this blue curve shows a gradation that is close to that of the maximum density. This is called a dense gradation as close that we can get to this ideal curve then denser becomes the gradation meaning that there are less gaps between the aggregates. The aggregates are better packed or more closely packed and other extreme would be all the aggregates having almost the same size. Here we have a distribution of different sizes of aggregates so that they pack inside each other and reduce the voids. Here in the red curve we have a uniform gradation that is almost all the aggregates in this case have a size of about 12.5 millimeters. In this case we will have more voids and we have do not have a dense packing. So, this is something that we would like to avoid and we would like to go closer to this blue curve. In some cases we can have some special gradations the purple line gives an open gradation where we have lower amount of fine material, more coarse material. So, we need more bitumen to fill the voids here and we will have something that is more flexible in nature because there will be more bitumen in the voids between the aggregates than in the case of a dense material. On the other hand we can have something called gap grading. This is not very much used in the case of asphalt, but sometimes in the case of cement concrete this is used to increase the fluidity where you have a fraction of the material taken away. For example, in this case between about 3 millimeters and about 10 millimeters we do we have a flat curve that indicates that there is not much material fraction in this range. There are fine material and coarser material, but the intermediate fraction is missing that is called gra gap gradation. Okay. So, there are different types of gradation possible generally what we want is a dense gradation in the asphalt concrete. So, asphalt as such looks something like this where you have a mixture of coarse aggregate generally stone and we have this interconnected with a mortar a mix of bitumen, fines and filler. So, the load is transferred mainly through the bitumen to the sub base. This is the traffic load say and this is transferred to the sub base 
through the bitumen especially in this case where we have a lot of gaps between the aggregates. We can also have a case where the aggregates are very closely packed this is in the case of a densely packed aggregate system this is often called macadam where the load transfer is through the contact between the aggregates. So, since the aggregates are almost touching each other continuously they form a network for the transfer of load through the aggregates. This would be something that would be stiffer less flexible compared to the previous case that we saw. So, these are uh, two aggregate grading curves taken from Ilston and Domon and the top curve shows a wearing course asphalt wearing course is the top surface of a pavement where you want a smooth ride you want a smooth surface and this could also be replaced uh, more often as the wearing occurs this top surface could be uh, replaced. Here we want a continuous grading and a stable aggregate structure with not much mobility in the aggregate structure. In a base course say in a macadam used in a base course we can have also a dense material with less fine material and more coarse material to give a lot of density and packing. So, depending on where this asphalt is used if it is in the top or in the bottom and depending on different applications the grading might change but generally we want a continuous aggregate grading leading to a dense gradation giving us a stable aggregate structure. Now, let us look at how the aggregates and the bitumen within uh, the asphalt interact. Generally the aggregate content in asphalt concretes is quite high about 90 percent or more by weight that is if you take a kilogram of asphalt concrete about 900 grams of that would be made out of stone or the aggregates within the asphalt concrete. Therefore, the aggregates have a very important role in terms of the stiffness and the flexibility of the mixture. We can imagine the asphalt concrete to be such as this model where you have aggregates which is the stone granite in most cases in India and there is a slight penetration of the bitumen into the aggregates. Then there is a coating of bitumen around and this bitumen now bonds one aggregate to the other in this case. this diagram has to be changed we have to put bitumen it instead of asphalt. So, what we see here is that we have aggregates we have bitumen absorbed in the surface of the aggregate and we have a thin coating of bitumen around the aggregates and this bonds together to form the asphalt concrete. So, as we saw the bitumen forms a thin layer around each aggregate particle it adsorbs a little bit into the surface and bonds one aggregate to the other. The interaction between the bitumen and aggregate occurs in all the different stages of the life of the asphalt first during mixing when the bitumen is liquid at high temperatures the interaction should be such that the bitumen coats the aggregate well and also facilitates the uniform mixing and the flow of the asphalt concrete. Then once the asphalt is placed has been rolled on the surface of a pavement the material starts to cure or the mixture starts to cool down. Here we have a viscoelastic behavior and the material should set fast without a lot of flow occurring after the pavement has been placed. Over the life of the pavement we could have a process of aging where the bitumen can change its characteristics or change its properties 
and if this affects the integrity of the asphalt, the asphalt starts to crack and fall apart. So, aging of the bitumen is also very important because it can affect the interaction between the bitumen and aggregate and therefore, the behavior of the asphalt. How good of a bond is formed between the bitumen and aggregates depends on the physical and chemical nature of both of these. If the aggregate has a clean surface, it has a rough surface, bitumen can bond well. If it, the aggregate surface is also slightly porous, the bond is even better. And on the other hand, if the bitumen can flow well, it can enter into this pores and create a better bond. So, basically we say that the ability of the bitumen to form a good bond depends on how well it is able to wet the aggregate surface. Remember when we talked about surface properties, we said that adhesion increases when the material that is bonding can wet the surface well and we do not want a thick layer, we want a thin layer around the aggregates. Generally when the aggregates are not wet or there is not water present, bitumen can wet the surface of most aggregates. However, when the aggregates are moist, what could happen is that the bitumen aggregate bond is prevented or it is disrupted, because the surface energy of water is lower. So, a layer of water forms between the bitumen and the aggregate and prevents the bitumen aggregate bond from occurring. This could happen in some cases. So, as we said good bonding is achieved by the mechanism of wetting, wetting of the surface of the aggregates by the liquid bitumen as well as mechanical interaction when the bitumen flows into the pores, it interlocks into the pores and any irregularities that can be on the surface of the aggregates. The bond can fail when there is a detachment or delamination of the bitumen from the aggregate surface. This could occur when there is a flaw, say a part of uh, the bond is not well developed and due to loading this defect or flaw propagates becomes a crack and you can have debonding of the bitumen from the surface of the aggregate. Another reason for bond failure could be the entry of water between the bitumen and the aggregate surface leading to an effect called stripping where the bitumen detaches from the surface as the water enters into the interface between the bitumen and the aggregate. We will continue to look at how asphalt concrete behaves and how we use it in uh, pavements along with some problems that occur when the design is not proper or the construction of the pavement is not proper in the next uh, half of this lecture. Thank you.